The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Allen Davis Drake in Long Branch, New Jersey Hear the sleighs with their bells, silver bells. What a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night. While the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tingling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells. What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. From the molten golden tones, and all in tune. What a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens, While she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells how it swells how it dwells oh the future how it tells of the rapture that impels to the swinging and the ringing of the bells 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 of the bells 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells. What a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled air of night, how they scream out their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek, out of tune. In a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with a deaf and frantic fire, Leaping higher, 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 With a desperate desire, And a resolute endeavor, Now, now to sit, Or never by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 What a tale their terror tells of despair! How they clang and crash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air! Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, How the danger ebbs and flows! Yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling, How the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling, In the anger of the bells. Of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rush within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone, and who tolling, 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 in the muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling in the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls, and their king it is who tolls. And he rolls, rolls, rolls a peon from the bells, And his merry bosom swells with the peon of the bells. And he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 This sort of runic rhyme to the peon of the bells of the bells, keeping time, 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 
in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox by Christy Nowak Part the First Tis the middle of the night by the castle clock, And the owls have awakened the crowing cock. To wit, to woo! And hark again! The crowing cock, how drowsily it crew! Sir Leoline, the baron rich, hath a toothless mastiff bitch. From her kennel beneath the rock maketh answer to the clock, four for the quarters and twelve for the hour. Ever and I, by shine and shower, sixteen short howls, not over loud. Some say she sees my lady's shroud. Is the night chilly and dark? The night is chilly but not dark. The thin gray cloud is spread on high. It covers, but not hides the sky. The moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. The night is chill, the cloud is gray. Tis a month before the month of May, and the spring comes slowly up this way. The lovely Lady Christabel, whom her father loves so well, what makes her in the woods so late, a furlong from the castle gate? She had dreams all yesternight of her own betrothed knight, and she in the midnight wood will pray for the wheel of her lover that's far away. She stole along, she nothing spoke. The sighs she heaved were soft and low, and naught was green upon the oak but moss and rarest mistletoe. She kneels beneath the huge oak tree, and in silence prayeth she. The lady sprang up suddenly, the lovely lady Christabel. It moaned as near as near can be, but what it is she cannot tell. On the other side it seems to be of the huge, broad-breasted old oak tree. The night is chill, the forest bare. Is it the wind that moaneth bleak? There is not wind enough in the air to move away the ringlet curl from the lovely lady's cheek. There is not wind enough to twirl the one red leaf, the last of its clan, that dances as often as dance it can, hanging so light and hanging so high, on the topmost twig that looks up at the sky. Hush, beating heart of Christabel! Jesu Maria, shield her well! She folded her arms beneath her cloak, and stole to the other side of the oak. What sees she there? There she sees a damsel bright, dressed in a silken robe of white, that shadowy in the moonlight shone. The neck that made that white robe wan, her stately neck, her arms were bare. Her blue-veined feet unsandaled were, and wildly glittered here and there the gems entangled in her hair. I guess t'was frightful there to see a lady so richly clad as she, Beautiful exceedingly. Mary, mother, save me now, said Christabel, and who art thou? The lady strange made answer meet, and her voice was faint and sweet. Have pity on my sore distress, I scarce can speak for weariness. Stretch forth thy hand and have no fear, said Christabel. How camest thou here? And the lady, whose voice was faint and sweet, did thus pursue her answer meet. 
My sire is of a noble line, and my name is Geraldine. Five warriors seized me yestermorn, me, even me, a maid forlorn. They choked my cries with force and fright, and tied me on a palfrey white. The palfrey was as fleet as wind, and they rode furiously behind. They spurred amain, their steeds were white, and once we crossed the shade of night. As sure as heaven shall rescue me, I have no thought what men they be, nor do I know how long it is, for I have lain entranced I was. Since one, the tallest of the five, took me from the palfrey's back, a weary woman, scarce alive, some muttered words his comrade spoke, he placed me underneath this oak. He swore they would return with haste, whither they went I cannot tell, I thought I heard some minutes past, sounds as of a castle bell, stretch forth thy hand, thus ended she, and help a wretched maid to flee. Then Christabel stretched forth her hand and comforted fair Geraldine. O oh, well, bright dame, may you command the service of Sir Leoline, and gladly our stout chivalry will he send forth, and friends withal, to guide and guard you safe and free, home to your noble father's hall. She rose, and forth with steps they passed, that strove to be, and were not, fast. Her gracious stars the lady blessed, and thus spake on sweet Christabel, all our household are at rest, the hall as silent as the cell. Sir Leoline is weak in health, and may not well awakened be. But we will move, as if in stealth, and I beseech your courtesy this night to share your couch with me. They crossed the moat, and Christabel took the key that fitted well a little door she opened straight, all in the middle of the gate. The gate, that was ironed within and without, where an army in battle array had marched out, the lady sank, belike through pain. And Christabel, with might and main, lifted her up, a weary weight, over the threshold of the gate. Then the lady rose again, and moved, as she were not in pain. So, free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were, and Christabel devoutly cried to the lady by her side, Praise we the Virgin all divine, who hath rescued thee from thy distress. Alas, alas, said Geraldine, I cannot speak for weariness. So, free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were. Outside her kennel the mastiff old lay fast asleep in moonshine cold. The mastiff old did not awake, yet she an angry moan did make. And what can ail the mastiff bitch? Never till now she uttered yell beneath the eye of Christabel. Perhaps it is the owlet's scritch. For what can ail the mastiff bitch? They passed the hall that echoes still. Pass as lightly as you will. The brands were flat, the brands were dying, amidst their own white ashes lying. But when the lady passed, there came a tongue of light, a fit of flame. And Christabel saw the lady's eye, and nothing else saw she thereby, save the boss of the shield of Sir Leoline Tall, which hung in a murky old niche in the wall. Oh, softly tread, said Christabel, my father seldom sleepeth well. Sweet Christabel, her feet doth bear, and jealous of the listening air, they steal their way from stair to stair, now in the glimmer, and now in the gloom. And now they pass the baron's room, as still as death with stifled breath, and now have reached her chamber door, and now doth Geraldine press down the rushes of the chamber floor. The moon shines dim in the open air, and not a moonbeam enters there, but they without its light can see the chamber carved so curiously, carved with figures strange and sweet, all made out of the carver's brain for a lady's chamber meet. The lamp with twofold silver chain is fastened to an angel's feet. The silver lamp burns dead and dim, but Christabel the lamp will trim. She trimmed the lamp and made it bright and left it swinging to and fro, while Geraldine in wretched plight sank down upon the floor below. 
O weary lady, Geraldine, I pray you, drink this cordial wine. It is a wine of virtuous powers. My mother made it of wild flowers. And will your mother pity me, who am a maiden most forlorn? Christabel answered, Woe is me! She died the hour that I was born. I have heard the gray-haired friar tell how, on her deathbed, she did say that she should hear the castle bell strike twelve upon my wedding day. O oh, mother dear, that thou wert here! I would, said Geraldine, she were. But soon, with altered voice, she said, off, wandering mother, peak and pine, I have power to bid thee flee. Alas, what ails poor Geraldine? Why stares she with unsettled eye? Can she the bodiless dead espy? And why with hollow voice cries she, Off, woman, off, this hour is mine, Though thou her guardian spirit be, Off, woman, off, tis given to me. Then Christabel knelt by the lady's side, And raised to heaven her eyes so blue. Alas, said she, this ghastly ride, dear lady, it hath wildered you. The lady wiped her moist, cold brow, and faintly said, "'Tis over now. Again the wildflower wine she drank, her fair large eyes gan glitter bright, and from the floor whereon she sank the lofty lady stood upright. She was most beautiful to see, like a lady of a far country. And thus the lofty lady spake. All they who live in the upper sky do love you, holy Christabel, and you love them, and for their sake, and for the good which me befell, even I, in my degree, will try, fair maiden, to requite you well. But now unrobe yourself, for I must pray, ere yet in bed I lie. Quoth Christabel, so let it be. And as the lady bade, did she, her gentle limbs did she undress, and lay down in her loveliness. But through her brain of weal and woe so many thoughts moved to and fro that vain it were her lids to close. So, halfway from the bed she rose, and on her elbow did recline to look at the Lady Geraldine. Beneath the lamp the lady bowed, and slowly rolled her eyes around. Then, drawing in her breath aloud like one that shuddered she unbound the cincture from beneath her breast her silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet and in full view behold her bosom and half her side a sight to dream of not to tell o oh, shield her shield sweet christabel yet geraldine nor speaks nor stirs ah what a stricken look was hers Deep from within she seems halfway to lift some weight with sick assay, and eyes the maid, and seeks delay. Then, suddenly, as one defied, collects herself in scorn and pride, and lay down by the maiden's side, and in her arms the maid she took. Ah, well a day! And with low voice and doleful look these words did say, in the touch of this bosom there worketh a spell, which is lord of thy utterance, Christabel. Thou knowest to-night, and wilt know to-morrow, this mark of my shame, this seal of my sorrow. But vainly thou warrest, for this is alone in thy power to declare, that in the dim forest thou heardst a low moaning, and foundst a bright lady surpassingly fair, and didst bring her home with thee in love and in charity, to shield and shelter her from the damp air. The Conclusion to Part the First It was a lovely sight to see the Lady Christabel when she was praying at the old oak tree amid the jagged shadows of mossy leafless boughs kneeling in the moonlight to make her gentle vows. Her slender palms together pressed heaving sometimes on her breast, her face resigned to bliss or bale, her face, oh, call it fair, not pale, and both blue eyes more bright than clear, each about to have a tear. With open eyes, ah, woe is me, asleep, and dreaming fearfully, fearfully dreaming yet I was, dreaming that alone, which is, O oh, sorrow and shame, can this be she, the lady who knelt at the old oak tree? And lo, 
The worker of these harms that holds the maiden in her arms seems to slumber still and mild as a mother with her child. A star hath set, a star hath risen. O Geraldine, since arms of thine have been the lovely lady's prison. O Geraldine, one hour was thine, thou'st had thy will. By tern and rill, the night birds all that hour were still. But now they are jubilant anew from cliff and tower. To woo, to woo, to woo, to woo, from wood and fell. And see, the lady Christabel gathers herself from out her trance. Her limbs relax, her countenance grows sad and soft. The smooth, thin lids close o'er her eyes, and tears she sheds, large tears that leave the lashes bright. And oft the while she seems to smile as infants in a sudden light. Yea, she doth smile, and she doth weep, like a youthful hermitess, beauteous in the wilderness, who, praying always, prays in sleep. And, if she move unquietly, perchance, tis but the blood so free comes back and tingles in her feet. No doubt she hath a vision sweet. What if her guardian spirit twere, what if she knew her mother near? But this she knows in joys and woes, that saints will aid if men will call, for the blue sky bends over all. Part the Second each matin bell the baron saith, Nells us back to a world of death. These words Sir Leoline first said When he rose and found his lady dead. These words Sir Leoline will say Many a morn to his dying day. And hence the custom in law began That still at dawn the sacristan Who duly pulls the heavy bell Five and forty beads must tell. Between each stroke a warning knell which not a soul can choose but hear from Brotha Head to Windermere. Saith Bracy the Bard, so let it knell. Let the drowsy sacristan still count as slowly as he can. There is no lack of such, I ween, as well fill up the space between. In Langdale Pike and Witch's Lair, in Dungeon Gill so foully rent, with ropes of rock and bells of air, three sinful sexton's ghosts are pent, who all give back one after t'other the death note to their living brother. And off too by the knell offended, just as their one, two, three is ended, the devil mocks the doleful tale with a merry peal from Borrowdale. The air is still. Through mist and cloud that merry peal comes ringing loud, and Geraldine shakes off her dread, and rises lightly from the bed, puts on her silken vestments white, and tricks her hair in lovely plight, and nothing doubting of her spell awakens the Lady Christabel. Sleep you, sweet Lady Christabel? I trust that you have rested well. And Christabel awoke and spied, the same who lay down by her side. Or rather say, the same whom she raised up beneath the old oak tree, nay, fairer yet, and yet more fair, for she belike hath drunken deep of all the blessedness of sleep. And while she spake, her looks, her air, such gentle thankfulness declare, that, so it seemed, her girded vest grew tight beneath her heaving breasts, "'Sure have I sinned,' said Christabel. "'Now heaven be praised if all be well.' And in low faltering tones, yet sweet, Did she the lofty lady greet, With such perplexity of mind As dreams too lively leave behind. So quickly she rose, and quickly arrayed Her maiden limbs, and having prayed That he who on the cross did groan Might wash away her sins unknown, She forthwith led fair Geraldine, to meet her sire, Sir Leoline. The lovely maid and the lady tall are pacing both into the hall, and pacing on through page and groom, enter the baron's presence room. The baron rose, and while he pressed his gentle daughter to his breast, with cheerful wonder in his eyes, the lady Geraldine espies, and gave such welcome to the same as might beseem so bright a dame. But when he heard the lady's tale, and when she told her father's name, why waxed Sir Leoline so pale, murmuring o'er the name again, Lord Roland de Vaux of Triermain? Alas, 
They had been friends in youth, but whispering tongues can poison truth, and constancy lives in realms above, and life is thorny, and youth is vain. And to be wroth with one we love doth work like madness in the brain, and thus it chanced, as I divined, with Roland and Sir Leoline. Each spake words of high disdain, and insult to his heart's best brother. They parted ne'er to meet again, but never either found another to free the hollow heart from paining. They stood aloof, the scars remaining. Like cliffs which had been rent asunder, a dreary sea now flows between. But neither heat nor frost nor thunder shall wholly do away, I ween, the marks of that which once hath been. Sir Leoline, a moment's space, stood gazing on the damsel's face, and the youthful lord of Triermain came back upon his heart again. Oh, the baron forgot his age, his noble heart swelled high with rage. He swore by the wounds in Jesus' side, he would proclaim it far and wide, with trump and solemn heraldry, that they who thus had wronged the dame were base as spotted infamy. And if they dare deny the same, my herald shall appoint a week, and let the recreant traitors seek my tourney court, that there and then I may dislodge their reptile souls from their bodies and forms of men. He spake. His eye in lightning rolls, for the lady was ruthlessly seized, and he kenned in the beautiful lady the child of his friend. And now the tears were on his face, and fondly in his arms he took fair Geraldine, who met the embrace, prolonging it with joyous look, which, when she viewed a vision, fell upon the soul of Christabel, a vision of fear, the touch of pain, she shrunk and shuddered and saw again, Ah, oh, woe is me! Was it for thee, thou gentle maid, such sights to see? Again she saw that bosom old, again she felt that bosom cold, and drew in her breath with a hissing sound, whereat the knight turned wildly round, and nothing saw but his own sweet maid, with eyes upraised, as one that prayed. The touch, the sight, had passed away, and in its stead that vision blessed which comforted her after rest, while in the lady's arm she lay, had put a rapture in her breast, and on her lips and o'er her eyes spread smiles like light with new surprise. What ails then, my beloved child? the baron said. His daughter mild made answer, All will yet be well. I ween, she had no power to tell aught else, so mighty was the spell, yet he who saw this Geraldine had deemed her sure a thing divine. Such sorrow with such grace she blended, as if she feared she had offended, sweet Christabel, that gentle maid, and with such lowly tone she prayed she might be sent without delay home to her father's mansion. Nay, nay, by my soul, said Leoline, Ho, oh, Bracy the Bard, the charge be thine. Go thou with music sweet and loud, and take two steeds with trappings proud, and take the youth whom thou lovest best, to bear thy harp and learn thy song, and clothe you both in solemn vest, and over the mountains haste along, lest wandering folk that are abroad detain you on the valley road. And when he has crossed the earthing flood, my merry bard, he hastes, he hastes, up nor and more through Halegarth wood, and reaches soon that castle good which stands and threatens Scotland's wastes. Bard Bracy, Bard Bracy, your horses are fleet, ye must ride up the hall, your music so sweet, more loud than your horse's echoing feet, and loud and loud to Lord Roland call, thy daughter is safe in Langdale Hall, thy beautiful daughter is safe and free. Sir Leoline greets thee thus through me, he bids thee come without delay with all thy numerous array and take thy lovely daughter home and he will meet thee on the way with all his numerous array white with their panting palfreys foam and by mine hour i will say that i repent me of the day when i spake words of fierce disdain to roland de vaux of treyermain for since that evil hour hath flown many a summer sun hath shone Yet ne'er found I a friend again like Roland de Vaux of Triermain. The lady fell and clasped his knees, her face upraised, her eyes o'erflowing, and Bracy replied with faltering voice, his gracious hail on all bestowing. 
Thy words, thou sire of Christabel, are sweeter than my harp can tell. Yet might I gain a boon of thee? This day my journey should not be, so strange a dream hath come to me, that I had vowed with music loud to clear yon wood from thing unblessed, warned by a vision in my rest. For in my sleep I saw that dove, that gentlest bird whom thou dost love, and callst by thine own daughter's name, Sir Leoline, I saw the same, fluttering and uttering fearful moan among the green herbs in the forest alone. And when I saw, and when I heard, I wondered what might ail the bird, for nothing near it could I see, save the grass and the green herbs underneath the old tree. And in my dream, methought, I went to search what might there be found, and what the bird's sweet trouble meant that thus lay fluttering on the ground. I went and peered and could descry no cause for her distressful cry, but yet, for her dear lady's sake, I stooped, methought, the dove to take, when, lo, I saw a bright green snake coiled around its wings and neck, green as the herbs on which it crouched, close by the dove's its head it crouched, and with the dove it heaves and stirs, swelling its neck as she swelled hers. I woke. It was the midnight hour. The clock was echoing in the tower. But though my slumber was gone by, this dream it would not pass away. It seems to live upon my eye. And thence I vowed this selfsame day with music strong and saintly song to wander through the forest bare, lest aught unholy loiter there. Thus Bracy said, the baron the while half listening heard him with a smile then turned to lady geraldine his eyes made up of wonder and love and said in courtly accents fine sweet maid lord roland's beauteous dove with arms more strong than harp or song thy sire and i will crush the snake he kissed her forehead as he spake and geraldine in maiden wise casting down her large bright eyes with blushing cheek and courteous fine she turned her from Sir Leoline, softly gathering up her train that o'er her right arm fell again, and folded her arms across her chest, and couched her head upon her breast, and looked askance at Christabel. Jesu, Maria, shield her well. A snake's small eye blinks dull and shy, in the lady's eyes they shrunk in her head, each shrunk up to a serpent's eye, and with somewhat of malice and more of dread, at Christabel she looked askance. One moment, and the sight was fled, but Christabel, in dizzy trance, stumbling on unsteady ground, shuddered aloud with a hissing sound, and Geraldine again turned round, and like a thing that sought relief, full of wonder and full of grief, she rolled her large, bright eyes divine wildly on Sir Leoline. The maid, alas, her thoughts are gone, she nothing sees, no sight but one. The maid, devoid of guile and sin, I know not how, in fearful wise, so deeply had she drunken in that look, those shrunken serpent eyes, that all her features were resigned to this sole image in her mind, and passively did imitate that look of dull and treacherous hate, and thus she stood, in dizzy trance, still picturing that look askance, with forced unconscious sympathy, full before her father's view, as far as such a look could be in eyes so innocent and blue. And when the trance was o'er, the maid paused a while and inly prayed, then, falling at the baron's feet. "'By my mother's soul do I entreat that thou this woman send away,' she said. And more she could not say, for what she knew she could not tell, or mastered by the mighty spell. "'Why is thy cheek so wan and wild, Sir Leoline? Thy only child lies at thy feet, thy joy, thy pride, so fair, so innocent, so mild, the same for whom thy lady died.' Oh, by the pangs of her dear mother, think thou no evil of thy child, for her and thee, and for no other, she prayed the moment ere she died, prayed that the babe for whom she died might prove her dear lord's joy and pride, that prayer her deadly pangs beguiled, Sir Leoline, and wouldst thou wrong thy only child, her child, and thine? Within the baron's heart and brain, if thoughts like these had any share, they only swelled his rage and pain and did but work confusion there. His heart was cleft with pain and rage, his cheeks they quivered, his eyes were wild, 
dishonored thus in his old age, dishonored by his only child, and all his hospitality to the insulted daughter of his friend by more than a woman's jealousy brought thus to a disgraceful end. He rolled his eye with stern regard upon the gentle minstrel bard, and said in tones abrupt, austere, "'Why, Bracy, dost thou loiter here? I bade thee hence.' The bard obeyed, and turning from his own sweet maid, the aged knight, Sir Leoline, led forth the lady, Geraldine. Conclusion to Part the Second A little child, a limber elf, singing, dancing to itself, a fairy thing with red round cheeks that always finds and never seeks, makes such a vision to the sight as fills a father's eyes with light. And pleasures flow in so thick and fast upon his heart that he at last must needs express his love's excess with words of unmet bitterness. Perhaps tis pretty to force together thoughts so all unlike each other, to mutter and mock a broken charm, to dally with wrong that does no harm. Perhaps tis tender too and pretty at each wild word to feel within the sweet recoil of love and pity. And what? If in a world of sin, O oh, sorrow and shame should this be true, Such giddiness of heart and brain Comes seldom save from rage and pain, So talks as it's most used to do. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fear by Robert Frost, read for LibriVox.org by Arctra. A lantern light from deeper in the barn shone on a man and a woman in the door, and threw their lurching shadows on a house nearby, all dark in every glossy window. A horse's hoof pawed once the hollow floor, and the back of the gig they stood beside moved in a little. The man grasped a wheel. The woman spoke out sharply. Whoa, stand still. I saw it just as plain as the white plate, she said, as the light on the dashboard ran along the bushes at the roadside. A man's face. You must have seen it too. I didn't see it. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. It was a face? Joel, I'll have to look. I can't go in. I can't and leave a thing like that unsettled. Doors locked and curtains drawn will make no difference. I always have felt strange when we came home to the dark house after so long an absence and the key rattled loudly into place seemed to warn someone to be getting out at one door as we entered at another. What if I'm right and someone all the time? Don't hold my arm. I say it's someone passing. You speak as if this were a traveled road. You forget where we are. What is beyond that he'd be going to or coming from at such an hour of night and on foot too? What was he standing still for in the bushes? It's not so very late. It's only dark. There's more in it than you're inclined to say. Did he look like... He looked like anyone. I'll never rest tonight unless I know. Give me the lantern. You don't want the lantern. She pushed past him and got it for herself. You're not to come, she said. This is my business. If the time's come to face it, I'm the one to put it the right way. He'd never dare... Listen, he kicked a stone. Hear that, hear that. He's coming toward us. Joel, go in, please. Hark, I don't hear him now, but please go in. In the first place, you can't make me believe it. It is, or someone else he sent to watch. And now is the time to have it out with him, while we know definitely where he is. Let him get off and he'll be everywhere, around us, looking out of trees and bushes till I shan't dare to set a foot outdoors, and I can't stand it. Joel, let me go. But it's nonsense to think he'd care enough. You mean you couldn't understand his caring? Oh, but you see he hadn't had enough. 
Joel, I won't, I won't, I promise you, we mustn't say hard things. You mustn't either. I'll be the one if anybody goes, but you give him the advantage with his light. What couldn't he do to us standing here? And if to see was what he wanted, why, he has seen all there was to see and gone. He appeared to forget to keep his hold, but advanced with her as she crossed the grass. What do you want? She cried to all the dark. She stretched up tall to overlook the light that hung in both hands hot against her skirt. There's no one, so you're wrong, he said. There is. What do you want? She cried, and then herself was startled when an answer really came. Nothing. It came from well along the road. She reached a hand to Joel for support. The smell of scorching woolen made her faint. What are you doing around this house at night? Nothing. A pause. There seemed no more to say. And then the voice again. You seem afraid. I saw by the way you whipped up the horse. I'll just come forward in the lantern light and let you see. Yes, do. Joel, go back. She stood her ground against the noisy steps that came on, but her body rocked a little. You see, the voice said. Oh, she looked and looked. You don't see. I have a child here by the hand. What's a child doing at this time of night? Out walking, every child should have the memory of at least one long after bedtime walk. What, son? Then I should think you'd try to find somewhere to walk. The highway, as it happens. We're stopping for the fortnight down at Dean's. But if that's all, Joel, you realize you won't think anything. You understand? You understand that we have to be careful? This is a very, very lonely place. Joel, she spoke as if she couldn't turn. The swinging lantern lengthened to the ground. It touched, it struck it, clattered, and went out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ladies' Dressing Room by Jonathan Swift Read for LibriVox.org by Yannan Drake August 5, 2006, Allentown, Pennsylvania Five Hours, and Who Can Do It in Less? By haughty Celia spent in dressing, The goddess from her chamber issues, Arrayed in lace, brocade in tissues. Strephon who found the room was void, and Betty otherwise employed, stole in and took a strict survey of all the litter as it lay, whereof to make the matter clear, an inventory follows here. And first a dirty smock appeared, beneath the armpits well besmeared, Strephron the rogue displayed it wide and turned it round on every side. In such a case few words are best, and Strephron bids us guess the rest, but swears how damnably the men lie in calling Celia sweet and cleanly. Now listen while he next produces the various combs for various uses, filled up with dirt so closely fixed, no brush could force a way betwixt, a paste of composition rare, sweat dandruff powder lead in hair, a forehead cloth with oil upon it to smooth the wrinkles on her front here a loom flower to stop the steams exhaled from sour unsavory streams their night gloves made of tripsy hide bequeathed by tripsy when she died with puppy water beauty's help distilled from tripsy's darling whelp here gallopots and veils placed, some filled with washes, some with paste, some with pamatin, 
paints and slops, and ointments good for scabby chops. Hard by a filthy basin stands, fouled with the scouring of her hands. The basin takes whatever comes, the scraping of her teeth and gums, a nasty compound of all hues. For here she spits, and here she spews. But oh, it turned poor Strephron's bowels, when he beheld and smelt the towels, begummed, be mattered, and beslimed, with dirt and sweat and earwax grimed, no object Strephron's eye escapes, her petticoats in frowsy heaps, nor be the handkerchiefs forgot, all varnished o'er with snuff and snot stockings why should i expose stained with the marks of stinking toes or greasy quaffs and pinners reeking which celia slept at least a week in a pair of tweezers next he found to pluck her brows and arches round or hairs that sink the forehead low or on her chin like bristles grow the virtues we must not let pass of celia's magnifying glass when frightened Strephron cast his eye on it, it showed the visage of a giant, a glass that can to slight disclose the smallest worm in Celia's nose, and faithfully direct her nail to squeeze it out from head to tail, for catch it nicely by the head, it must come out alive or dead. Why, Strephron, will you tell the rest? and must you needs describe the chest the careless wench no creature warn her to move it out from yonder corner but leave it standing full in sight for you to exercise your spite in vain the workman showed his wit with rings and hinges counterfeit to make it seem in his disguise a cabinet to vulgar eyes for strephron ventured to look in Resolved to go through thick and thin, he lifts the lid, there needs no more, he smelt it all the time before, as from within Pandora's box, when Epimethus oped the locks, a sudden universal crew of human evils upward flew, he still was comforted to find that hope at last remained behind, so Strephron lifting up the lid to view what in the chest was hid, the vapors flew from out the vent, but Strephron cautious never meant the bottom of the pan to grope and foul his hands in search of hope. Oh, never may such vile machine be once in Celia's chamber seen. Oh, may she better learn to keep those secrets of the hoary deep. As mutton cutlets prime of meat which thou with art you salt and beat, as laws of cookery require, and roast them at the clearest fire. If from a down the hopeful chops, the fat upon a cinder drops, to sinking smoke it turns the flame, poisoning the flesh from whence it came, and thence exiles a greasy stench, for which you curse the careless wench. So things which must not be expressed, when plumped into a reeking chest, send up an excremental smell, to taint the parts from which they fell. The petticoats and gown perfume, and waft a stink around the room. Thus finishing his grand survey, the swain disgust slunk away repeating in his amorous fits, Oh, Celia, 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 shits! But vengeance, goddess, never sleeping, soon punished Strephron for his peeping. His foul imagination links each dam he sees with all her stinks, and if unsavory odors fly, conceives a lady standing by. All women his description fits, and both ideas jump like wits by vicious fancy coupled fast and still appearing in contrast i pity wretched strephron blind to all the charms of womankind 
Should I, the queen of love, refuse Because she rose from stinking ooze? To him that looks behind the scene Dat Tira's but some pocky queen When Celia in her glory shows If Strephron would but stop his nose Who now so impiously blasphemes Her ointments, daubs, and paints and creams Her washes slops in every clout with which she makes so foul a rout. He soon would learn to think like me, and bless his ravished eyes to see, such order from confusion sprung, such gaudy tulips raised from dung. End poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Lord Tennyson Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri for LibriVox.org in August of 2006. Courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke, the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. A land of streams, some, like a downward smoke, slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go, and some through wavering lights and shadows broke, rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below. They saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land. Far off, three mountain tops, three silent pinnacles of aged snow, stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops, up clomb the shadowy pine above the woven copse. The charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west. Through mountain clefts the dale was seen far inland, and the yellow downs bordered with palm, and many a winding vale and meadow, set with slender gallingale, a land where all things always seemed the same and round about the keel, with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed, melancholy lotus-eaters came. Branches they bore of that enchanted stem, laden with flower and fruit, whereof they gave to each, but whoso did receive of them, and taste, to him the gushing of the wave far, far away did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores, and if his fellow spake, his voice was thin, as voices from the grave, and deep asleep he seemed, yet all awake, and music in his ears his beating heart did make. They sat them down upon the yellow sand, between the sun and moon upon the shore, and sweet it was to dream of fatherland, of child and wife and slave. But evermore most weary seemed the sea, weary the oar, weary the wandering fields of barren foam. Then some one said, We will return no more. And all at once they sang, our island home is far beyond the wave. We will no longer roam. Coric Song There is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass, or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass. Music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes. Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies. Here are cool mosses deep, and through the moss the ivies creep, and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. Why are we weighed upon with heaviness, and utterly consumed with sharp distress, while all things else have rest from weariness? All things have rest. Why should we toil alone, we only toil, who are the first of things, and make perpetual moan still from one sorrow to another throne, nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings, nor steep our brows in slumber's holy balm, nor hearken what the inner spirit sings, there is no joy but calm. Why should we toil the roof and crown of all things? Lo, in the middle of the wood the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud with winds upon the branch, and there grows green and broad, and takes no care, sun-steeped at noon, and in the moon nightly dew-fed, and turning yellow falls, and floats adown the air. Lo, sweetened with the summer light, the full-juiced apple, waxing over mellow, drops in a silent autumn night. All its allotted length of days, the flower ripens in its place, ripens and fades, and falls, and hath no toil, fast rooted in the fruitful soil. Hateful is the dark blue sky, 
vaulted o'er the dark blue sea. Death is the end of life. Oh, why should life all labor be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast, and in a little while our lips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us, and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? All things have rest and ripen toward the grave in silence, ripen, fall, and cease. Give us long rest or death, dark death or dreamful ease. How sweet it were, hearing the downward stream, with half-shut eyes, ever to seem falling asleep in a half-dream. To dream and dream, like yonder amber light, which will not leave the myrrh-bush on the height, to hear each other's whispered speech, eating the lotus day by day, to watch the crisping ripples on the beach, and tender curving lines of creamy spray, to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild-minded melancholy, to muse and brood and live again in memory, with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass, two handfuls of white dust shut in an urn of brass. Dear is the memory of our wedded lives, and dear the last embraces of our wives and their warm tears, but all have suffered change, for surely now our household hearths are cold, our sons inherit us, our looks are strange, and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy. Or else the island princes overbold have eat our substance, and the minstrel sings before them of the ten years war in Troy, and our great deeds as half-forgotten things. Is there confusion in the little isle? Let what is broken so remain. The gods are hard to reconcile. Tis hard to settle order once again. There is confusion worse than death. Trouble on trouble, pain on pain, long labor unto aged breath, sore task to hearts worn out by many wars, and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars. But propped on beds of amaranth and moly, how sweet, while war mares lull us, blowing lowly, with half-dropped eyelids still, beneath a heaven dark and holy, to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill, to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine, to watch the emerald-colored water falling through many a woven acanthus wreath divine, only to hear and see the far-off sparkling brine, only to hear were sweet, stretched out beneath the pine. The lotus blooms below the barren peak, the lotus blows by every winding creek, all day the wind breathes low with mellower tone, through every hollow cave and alley lone, Round and round the spicy downs the yellow lotus dust is blown. We have had enough of action, and of motion we, Rolled to starboard, rolled to larboard, where the surge was seething free, Where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea. Let us swear an oath, and keep it with an equal mind, In the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined On the hills like gods together, careless of mankind. For they lie beside their nectar, and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys, and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses, girdled with the gleaming world, where they smile in secret, looking over wasted lands, blight and famine, plague and earthquake, roaring deeps and fiery sands, clanging fights and flaming towns, and sinking ships and praying hands. But they smile. They find a music centred in a doleful song steaming up, a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong, like a tale of little meaning, though the words are strong, chanted from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil, sow the seed, and reap the harvest with enduring toil, storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil, till they perish and they suffer, some, tis whispered, down in hell, suffer endless anguish, others in Elysian valleys dwell, resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel, Surely, surely, slumber is more sweet than toil, The shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean, Wind and wave and oar. O rest, ye brother mariners, We will not wander more. End of The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Lord Tennyson This recording is in the public domain. The Seafarer from the Anglo-Saxon by Ezra Pound Recorded for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake 
May I from my own self-song's truth reckon, Journey's jargon, How I in harsh days hardship endured oft. Bitter breast cares have I abided, Known on my keel many a care's hold, And dire sea surge, And there I oft spent narrow night watch Nigh the ship's head, While she tossed close to cliffs. Coldly afflicted my feet were by frost benumbed. Chill its chains are. Chafing sighs hew my heart round, And hunger begot mere weary mood, Lest man know not that he on dry land Loveliest liveth. List how I, care-wretched, on ice-cold sea, Weathered the winter, Watched outcasts deprived of my kinship, Hung with hard ice flakes, where hailscut flew. There I heard naught save the harsh sea and the ice cold wave. At whiles the swan cries, did for my games the gannets clamor. Sea fowl's loudness was for me laughter. The muse singing all my me drink. Storms on the stone cliffs beaten fell on the stern in icy feathers. Full off the eagle screamed with a spray on his pinion. Not any protector may make merry man faring needy. This he little believes, who I in winsome life abides mid burghers some heavy business, wealthy and wine flushed. How I weary oft must abide above brine. Nearest nightshade snoweth from north. Frost froze the land, hail fell on earth then, corn of the coldest, Nathless there knocketh now, the heart's thought that I on high stream The salt wavy tumult transverse alone, Moaneth always my mind's lust that I fare forth, That I afar hence seek out a foreign fastness. For this there's no mood lofty man above earth's mist, Not though he be given his good, But will have in his youth greed, Nor his deed to the daring, Nor his king to the faithful, But shall have his sorrow for seafare, Whatever his lord will. He hath not heart for harping, Nor in ring-having, Nor winsomeness to wife, nor world's delight, nor any wit, Else save the wave's slash. Yet longing comes upon him To fare forth on the water. Bosk taketh blossom, Cometh beauty of berries, Fields to fairness, Land fares briskier. All this admonisheth man eager of mood, The heart turns to travel so that he then thinks on floodways to be far departing. Cuckoo calleth with gloomy crying. He singeth summerwood, bodeth sorrow, the bitter heart's blood. Burger knows not, he the prosperous man, what some perform where wandering them wildest draweth, so that, but now, my heart bursts from my breastlock. My mood midst the mere flood over the whale's acre would wander wild. My earth's shelter cometh off to me, eager and ready. The crying lone flyer wets for the whale path, the heart irresistibly o'er trails of ocean, seeing that anyhow my lord deems to me this dead life on lone and on land. I believe not that any earth-wheel eternal standeth, Save there be somewhat calamitous, That ere a man's tide go, turn it to twain. Disease or oldness or sword-hate Beats out the breath from doom-gripped body, And for this every earl whatever, For those speaking after, laud the living, Boasteth some last word, that he will work ere he passed onward. Frame on the fair earth gainst foes his malice. 
daring adieu, so that all men shall honor him after, and his lord beyond them remain mid the English, I, for ever, a lasting life's blast, delight mid the doughty, days little durable, and all arrogance of earth and riches. There come now no kings, nor Caesars, nor gold-giving lords like those gone. However in mirth most magnified, whoever lived in life most lordliest, drear all excellence, delights undurable, warneth the watch, but the world holdeth. Tombs hideth trouble, the blade is laid low, Earthly glory ageth and seereth, No man at all going the earth's gate, But age fares against him, his face paleth, Gray-haired he groaneth, knows gone companions, Lordly men are to earth's overgiven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-I-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Recorded by Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones. Smokestack Jones at gmail.com. The Shooting of Dan McGrew by Robert W. Service. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. That kid that handles the music box was hitting a jag time tune. Back at the bar in a solo game sat dangerous Dan McGrew, and watching his luck was his light of love, that lady that's known as Lou. When out of the night, which was fifty below, and into the din and the glare, there stumbled a miner fresh from the creeks, dog dirty and loaded for bear. He looked like a man with a foot in a grave and scarcely the strength of a louse. Yet he tilted a poke of dust on the bar, and he called for drinks on the house. There was none that could place the stranger's face, though we searched ourselves for a clue, but we drank his health, and the last to drink was dangerous Dan McGrew. There's men that somehow just grip your eyes and hold them hard like a spell, and such was he, and he looked to me like a man who had lived in hell, with a face most hair and the dreary stare of a dog whose day is done, as he watered the green stuff in his glass and the drops fell one by one. And I got to figuring who he is and wondering what he'd do. I turned my head, and there watching him was a lady that's known as Lou. His eyes were rubbering around the room, and he seemed in a kind of daze, till at last that old piano fell in the way of his wandering gaze. The ragtime kid was having a drink. There was no one else on the stool. So the stranger stumbles across the room and flops down there like a fool. In a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt, he sat, and I saw him sway. Then he clutched those keys with his taloned hands. My God, but that man could play. Were you ever out in the great alone when the moon was awful clear and the icy mountains hemmed you in with a silence you could almost hear with only the howl of a timber wolf and you camped there in the cold, a half-dead thing in a stark dead world clean mad for the muck called gold? While high overhead, green, yellow, and red, the northern lights swept in bars, then you've a hunch what the music meant, hunger and night and stars. And hunger not of the belly kind, that's banished with bacon and beans, but the gnawing hunger of lonely men for a home and all that it means, for a fireside far from the cares that are, four walls and a roof above, but oh, so cramful of cozy joy and crowned with a woman's love. A woman dearer than all the world, and true as heaven is true. God, how ghastly she looks through a rouge, the lady that's known as Lou. Then on a sudden the music changed, so soft you could scarce could hear, but you felt your life had been looted clean and for all it once held dear. That someone had stolen the woman you loved, that her love was a devil's lie, that your guts are gone and the best for you was to crawl away and die. T'was the crowning glory of heart's despair as it thrilled you through and through. I guess I'll make it a spread, Miss Air, said Dangerous Dan McGrew. The music almost died away, then it burst like a pent-up flood, and it seemed to say, Repay, repay, and my eyes were blind with blood. The thought came back of an ancient wrong, and it stung like a frozen lash. And the lust awoke to kill, to kill! 
and the music stopped with a crash, and the stranger turned, and his eyes they burned in a most peculiar way, in a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt he sat, and I saw him sway. Then his lips went in in a kind of a grin, and he spoke, and his voice was calm. Said, and boys, said he, you don't know me, and none of you care a damn, but I want to state, and my words are straight, and I'll bet my poke they're true, that one of you is a hound in hell, and that one is Dan McGrew. Then I ducked my head, and the lights went out, and two guns blazed in the dark, and a woman screamed, and the lights went up, and two men lay stiff and stark. Pitched on his head and pumped full of lead was dangerous Dan McGrew. While well, the man from the creeks lay clutched to the breast of the lady that's known as Lou. These are the simple facts of the case, and I guess I ought to know. They say the stranger was crazed with hooch, and I'm not denying it so. I'm not so wise as the lawyer guys, but strictly between us two, the woman that kissed him and pinched his poke was the lady that's known as Lou. End of the shooting of Dan McGrew by Robert W. Service.